And please welcome Christine Carson! Here she comes! Woo, 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 woo! She's a get it done girl! Thank you. Well, hello, hello. Nice to see you all. I'm your end of the day finale. And now I'm going to ask you all that you're all revved up to close your eyes. <laughs> so um, I would like to ask you to support me in a prayer that I say when I go on any platform and I speak. And we'll just take three very deep breaths, and I'll ask you to just bring your energy into your core and become very present to what I have to share with you today. And breathe in sunlight, knowing that that is a source that we all come from, that is the source we return to. It is our strength, it is our life force. And my prayer is always, divine love, play me as an instrument in your finely tuned orchestra of life. So before I, you can open your eyes now, before I launch into my PowerPoint or my talk, and I guess there's a little clicker over here, um, I've never really used one of these, so... I might go forwards and backwards a little bit, but we'll, we'll get it right. Um, I'd love to just know if, how many of you in the room have any of the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books? Okay. And then a couple questions I'd love to ask you are, um, how many in the room know that their lives, um, when you're in alignment, are a mind-body-spirit connection? Okay, good. All right, so when I asked Vinka what she'd like me to speak on today, she asked me to speak on what is it, what do people do when they reach obstacles in their lives? What, how can we have obstacles and adversity and overcome it to become our best selves? And so before I launch into that topic, I'm just going to launch into a little bit of our personal story. So Richards and my um, life together began when I was with him at Pepperdine University. I was 18 and he was 20. And we had sort of that fairy tale romance where we met and it was love at first sight and love at first meeting. And we began our journey together uh, in college, got married four years later. And then about three years after that had our first, we always say we co-authored our first child, <laughs> Jasmine. And then we had Kenna two years after that. And Richard's, um, our success story is really typical of your overnight success story. It took 10 years and 10 books. And prior to Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, um, he had written 10 books. And some of them are very popular now, but they weren't so popular then. You can be happy no matter what. Uh, five principles your therapist never told you was the foundation of Richard's work. And I was very blessed in the early days as he was learning those principles. I was learning right alongside of him. So we were kind of unique in our 20s. We had, I had come from a very um, spiritual but very evangelical Christian household. Richard did not come from a truly um, anything background that way, but he was, had a very amazing value system. His dad owned a company and was bringing people like Ram Dass and Stephen Levine in and, uh, to speak to his company. And Richard was an, um, an athlete. He was an all-American tennis player, slated number one at Pepperdine. And so his whole thing in, as an athlete was to study Wayne Dyer and the pop psychologist because he realized um, when he was about 17 years old that his physical ability was not going to be what made him the best athlete 
It was his mental ability. And so he understood that to understand his own psychology and how he could better his own psychology would make him excel as an athlete. Now he met me and his whole world turned upside down, as often love does. I was not very popular with the um, tennis coach, Alan Fox, at Pepperdine, <laughs> because he was slated number one, and he quit the year that he met me. Now, he will tell you that for him, at that stage of the game, his calling was to serve. And he began his service work with Big Brothers of America. He felt that he really, he didn't have time to do those things and he really wanted to do those things. He also wanted to become a really amazing student. And he was always a good student, but being an athlete was his priority. And so his, his goals at that time changed and he would tell you that all he needed was some support in his life to make those changes. And so he did. He um, began studying poli-sci in business. I studied communications. That all makes sense, right? <laughs> and um, he then, um, about, um, I guess, let's see, I was almost graduating, and he had already graduated. He was six classes short of his MBA program, and we had lunch in Berkeley. And he turned to me and he said, um, I just want you to know that I am not going to be a financial planner. I am going to be a rolfer. <laughs> he said, I'm a healer, and I don't know what this, what this journey is going to take me on, but I know that I'm a healer, and so I'm going to begin this journey as a body worker, and, and I'm going to see where it goes. And then through those next few years, we got married, and he began his rolfing practice, and then he got his uh, master's and PhD in psychology, and then he knew he was a writer. So he began to write, and um, like I said, he wrote 10 books. Just before Richard uh, was really close to quitting, you know, because 10 years is a long time to be struggling and to um, be trying to support a family by your art, right? And, and we had an evening dinner where he was very despondent, which wasn't usual for him. And he said, you know, I just wrote this book. It was called Shortcut Through Therapy, and I only got a $5,000 advance. It was a whole year it took him. And he just said, you know, I, I, I don't feel like he had this also this happiness training he did, which would be equivalent to coaching practice now. But at that time, he would take people through 10 sessions of happiness training, and he said, I get people happy so quick that I'm not, I have a hard time building a practice. <laughs> so he said, I think I might have to get a real job. And I said, but you can't. You can't do that because you love to write, and this is your calling. You know, you can't do that. And he said, well, we have to pay the bills, and we're not doing that right now. We're, we're getting in debt, and I don't want to do that. So we left that dinner and we walked in our, our front door. And as I walked in, I came in earlier because he was following behind me in his car. And the phone rang. I went to the telephone, I picked up the phone. And I said, hello. A woman on the other end said, hi, this is Alice McGee from the Oprah Winfrey Show. <laughs> she says, the strangest thing just happened. She says, I was bent down in our library looking for a book on stress management. Your husband's book, You Can Be Happy No Matter What, popped off the top shelf and hit me in the back of the head. <laughs> Fifteen minutes earlier, as we were having the conversation that he was going to quit his calling. That book popped off the back I hit her in the back of the head. She calls and she says, do you think there's any way your husband could be on a plane tomorrow and come out to the Oprah Winfrey show? <laughs> and I, Richard walked in and I said, hon, do you think you could be on a plane to the Oprah Winfrey show tomorrow? 
And you know, the only time I ever saw him look that awestruck <laughs> was when we had the birth of our first child. <laughs> he was just, he, he's like, yes, you know. So my point in that story is to lead into my topic today of resiliency. Because the truth is that most people, and Richard included, almost quit. They almost quit right before they're going to meet with their destiny or their goal or their big something. And that if you can stay in the game a little bit longer, then you will meet your calling, especially when something is so in your heart and you are so inspired to do it. You know, I, I truly believe that resiliency happens when we are fully aligned in our mind, body, and spirit. And at these different points in our lives when we meet this alignment, that that's when we call everything into our lives that is meant to be in our lives. And we call all abundance and everything. Now that can be a little bit challenging to stay in alignment, and I find it challenging too. So. But if that's the goal, and you, you look at what are you doing for your mind, what are you doing for your body, what are you doing for your spirit to bring those things into alignment, then you're on to something. Okay, now I get to figure out if this is the right way. It is! Yay! All right. So don't sweat the small stuff. Because what happens to all of us when we sweat the small stuff is... Here's my best analogy about that. If you take a little black dot and you put it on a really, like a white page, and the, the black dot is the thing that you're focused on that hasn't worked out. It could be an annoying conversation that somebody had with you that annoys you. It could, you know, you're rehearsing it over and over in your mind, what are you going to say to them the next time you talk to them? It could be... A, um, an argument you had with your spouse. It could be something your kids are doing that's driving you nuts. It could be that there's the person in the grocery line and they have, you know, they're in the 10, the 10 item line and they've got 15 items and you've counted them all and they should not be in that line. But the point being that what happens when we're in the habit of sweating the small stuff is that we begin to focus our life attention on that one dot instead of all the life that's happening to us in the white space. That everything that you could be engaged with, that you could be focusing on, is happening in the white space. But you're instead transfixed on that one dot. So don't sweat the small stuff, because you need your reserve power to live the big stuff. Now one might ask, well, what is the big stuff? Believe me, if you have to ask, you don't know what it is. <laughs> because the big stuff is not only, it's not only negative. The big stuff is the big joys that you experience, too. It's the weddings in your life. It's the births of your children. It's all of the big things that happen in your career. That's the big stuff, too. But the big stuff are the things that bring you to your knees in life. They're the things that you have to ask this one question. Can I change this when it's happened to me? Can I change this? In December of 2006, December 13th, my husband walked out the door going on a normal business trip. And four hours later, he was dead. He died of a pulmonary embolism, something that he was on a flight to New York, something that nobody could have foreseen, including him. Well, I have to tell you that I learned more about what the small stuff was when that happened to me. Because at that point in my life, with two kids in high school, one 14 and one 17, I was the least prepared person in my mind to ever expect this to happen to my life. But I'll tell you what, anything that I was concerned about prior to that day didn't even touch my radar and still hasn't seven years later. There's no room in my life for anything that is small stuff. There just isn't. There's too much 
of life for me to take care of now and for me to live. And I say bounce because this is what we are born to do naturally, is to bounce through life's minor annoyances. And actually, we even bounce through the big ones too. We really do. So I'm here to talk about what do we do when we face this kind of adversity, these kinds of big life changes. It could be losing your job. It could be starting over. It could be being in the empty nest. It could be anything. But what you really want to do is, you know, if you stand at the top of uh, like a mountain and you're looking from the bottom to the top, and you're, you're gonna about ready to go on a hike, that's very overwhelming, right? So if you notice most paths, mountain paths, they do switchbacks because it's much gentler. There's almost like a way that you just keep going and you don't even notice that you're climbing until you get to the top and you're at the summit. Well, this is how you can live your life too, in the midst of transformation. Now, have any of you, have you ever felt like you're the burning tree in the middle there? <laughs> yes, Michio, of course. Transformation looks, can look really messy. It really can. It can look very, very messy. But when you take it in steps, <coughs> You can transcend adversity by taking it in small steps, just like you climb the mountain. The first step would be to access your courage. And I'll talk about these in detail in a minute. The second step would be to identify for yourself that you are not a victim of your circumstances, that you must create and facilitate that you are a victor. And I'll talk about that, too. The third is that you have to embrace change. And there's a mantra that I'm going to share with you that really, really helped me to embrace change, that in this process of loss, I had to call on every emotional tool that I had in my tool belt. And the ones that I really needed just came forward. They came forward to show me my own path of healing. You need to lean into your fear, which is very contrary to what we're taught a lot of times. You know, we're taught to move away, or we just naturally move away from those things that we're afraid of. And lastly, you have to practice presence. You have to realize that while your story is incredibly valuable, especially to other people, you are not your story. You are not your story. You are, you are the culmination of everything that has happened to you, and you are none of it. And I'll talk about that. So when I ask you to access your courage, what I, what I would like you to do is just think about, for a moment, a time in your life where it took tremendous courage for you to keep yourself safe, for you to keep your family safe, or for you to confront somebody or somebody else in your life. We all have these moments in our lives. My favorite story about how I knew I had courage was one time I was, um, it was probably in my late 30s, and I was at Sun Valley Mall, which is a local mall here. And I was coming out to my car, and I had gone on a shoe binge. I was thinking about how I was going to hide all these shoes from Richard. I mean, look at my shoes. Can you <laughs> look at my shoes? See, I love shoes. So I was thinking about how, <laughs> how can I hide these shoes from, from Richard so he doesn't see it, how, what a bad shoe habit I have, you know? And I, you know, I had, like, bags in my hands. Well, I noticed as I was walking out the door, my, my car was parked quite a ways away. I noticed as I was walking out the door, there were these two very large men walking behind me. And they had um, low-riding pants. I mean, I mean, they were large. They were like seven feet. One was African-American, one was white, and they had chains. And, you know, I hate to stereotype people, but, you know, you, I, they didn't look like they were necessarily from my neighborhood. <laughs> so I, I was watching them, and, and I kept my eye on them, and they were walking behind me, and I was walking out to my car, and I got to my car, and I noticed they stopped at a car. And... So I figured they were getting in their car, and I wasn't worried anymore. Well, here I am. I'm open up my, my open up my car, and I had a um, what I have an Escalade. It was probably the hottest car to hijack 
to carjack at the time, and I knew that. I had that. I knew that. But of course, in your neighborhood, you always feel safe, right? So I opened up my car, and I here I was shoving my boxes in, and I had my you know my back was this way. Well, I don't know what I do. I do not know what signaled to me. All I know is that I felt this presence come to the back of my car. And I felt it. And in my mind, in one moment, I remember thinking, hell no, I am not going to become a victim because I went shoe shopping. <laughs> and I took my hand, my hand was down low, and I opened my car door and I threw my arm out like this and I said, stop right there. <laughs> That man, seven feet tall, literally, in his mind, I had a gun. In his mind, his whole body just flew back, you know. And I was, and I, I, I jumped in my car, slammed the door, and I drove off. And he was still standing there. Whoa, what was that? And I was saying to myself, wow, wow, where did that come from? You know, who did that? Who did that? Well, I'll tell you who did that. Who did that was an incredibly courageous woman who refused, refused in that single moment to become a victim. And it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot that that was where I stood in that moment. And it was those kinds of experiences that came back to me in my loss where I remember knowing that this was going to be the most difficult transition and change that I could ever go through in my life. To lose my life partner, the love of my life, at 43 years old. He was only 45 when he died. I knew that I was standing at this crossroads, and I could see myself both ways. I could see myself being a victim in this circumstance, or I could see myself standing in it and saying to myself, Chris, you have lived the most amazing life. In my 43 years, I had traveled the world with my husband. I had experienced magic spiritually. I had experienced the most blissful marriage. I had experienced a lot and I was richly blessed, and even though I was really pissed off at God, because I was, I knew that my attitude was the only thing I had control over. The only thing. My life was completely in shambles, and I knew that too. I had gone from being the most envied woman to being the most pitied overnight. I, my kids were a mess. I had to make their lives, you know, I had to negotiate their lives with them and change everything about everything. But the one thing I knew was that I could not become a victim of this story. I could not become a victim of these circumstances. And Richard had taught me many things. And just in October before he died, he turned to me and he said, you know, Chris, you know what I love about the human spirit? And I said, what? He said, I love that there are people in this world that take their greatest tragedy and they allow it to move them forward so their lives have greater meaning than they might have otherwise had. He also said that the circumstances of life don't make or break you, but they reveal who you are. And I thought about those two things a lot. In my moments of my pity parties and in my grief, I thought about that a lot. And I didn't know what all this meant as far as my growth or my journey or how this would shape up in what I was here to do on this planet. But I knew that Richard's love was present with me and I knew that this loss had to count for a thousand years of my personal growth. It had to. Because I wasn't going to let this go by and not get every squeeze, every bit of wisdom, every bit of everything I was to glean from this experience. Because I knew, on some level, this was no accident.
So I put into practice, as I embrace change, a mantra. Now mantras are used um, in the metaphysical world to really create a pathway in your subconscious mind. A pathway, and I, I say this mantra really created a pathway for healing, and call it the star mantra. And it really is about embracing transformation. And surrender, trust, accept, release, and receive. There's a lot I can say about this, but I will tell you that I said over and over and over daily, I don't know, maybe anywhere from 10 to 100 times a day, I would say, I have to surrender to this. I cannot change this. I cannot change this. If I resist this, if I resist what is right now, it's like holding a cancer inside me, and I am not willing to do that. If I have to live this life, which I do, I need to move through this experience. I need to hope and pray that I will arrive again at a place of joy. Because I didn't know. But that's what I prayed for, and I surrendered. I trusted. I accepted. I released to receive a new life. Now, one of the other principles that I put into practice during this time that this works, no matter what stage of your life that you're in, is to really lean into your fears. You know, believe me, after being married and being a child bride on many levels, I had a lot of fears without my husband next to me. A lot of fears. And he had size 15 shoes. So he had big shoes to fill. And I knew I couldn't do that, too. So I, I did things like, about four months in, um, Richard's, one of his assistants asked me, she called me up, she said, well, I, I'm getting married. You know I'm getting married. She says, I, I, I would have asked Richard to um, marry us. And, and I was out on a run, and I, I realized I should ask you instead. Well, can you imagine four months into my grief? I mean, losing my husband, and then somebody asked me to marry him. I'm like, I'm like in my mind, I'm like, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> like, why would you do that? And I said yes. Well, it was, you know, I looked at it later, like, wow, God must have really meant for me to empty out my grief because every time I went to, you know, rehearse, I couldn't do it. I just cried and cried and cried because it was just so, you know, it was just. I couldn't believe that I was seeing her to the beginning of her marriage, but I was in the end of mine. So I did, though, and what I learned from that was a lot because it actually, as I leaned into my fears about a lot of things, I learned that right behind my fear was my next greatest expression. It was my next greatest expression of my authenticity. And what I started to realize as I leaned into all the fears that I had about being alone and everything was that I got to know myself. You know, I really got to know myself. When your ego is just completely annihilated, what you're left with is who you really are, right? And I was feeling myself in a totally different way. I was also feeling a tremendous relief on some level because as the woman of the house, the wife of Richard Carlson and the mother of my kids, I, I really carried this incredible pressure to hold the perfect life for everyone. Well, our lives were far from perfect now. But you know what? I felt okay about that because I wasn't holding it anymore. The funniest thing happened, my shoulders started letting down. I wasn't feeling, I just wasn't feeling a lot of the pressures that I lived with before. And I started to see that as I leaned in to the things that I was most afraid of, public speaking being one of them, I was really getting close to just being closer to expressing who I really am. Now, the key to all of this that's really challenging, and this is challenging for everyone, is that you get to this place, you know, you have these things that happen to you, and at some point you've got to become the witness 
of what's happened to you. Instead of being in the drama of the story and owning the story. Now, I own my story in a little bit different way than most people because I, need to, I, I use it as a way to teach and to speak on these principles of how you go through big life changes and transition. Because I don't know about you, but I wanted to have somebody tell me this. You know what I mean? I wanted somebody to lead me and say, these are the things you need to do. And I feel like that's one of the only ways that you can really prepare for loss is just to know that there is a plan for you. There is steps that you can take when you're facing big life changes and transitions. And to practice presence is really, that is the key. Because if you're not focused on your past story and you're not worried and in fear about your future, then you become very in alignment with this moment. And that's where that alignment of resilience happens in your mind, body, and spirit. It happens in the present moment. It happens as you take in your life as an experience, but you're not attached to all the outcomes. And so everything that you do in your business life, in your personal relationships, everything you do, can be, you can bring your total presence to it. And everything will benefit so greatly. So that kind of brings me to the close of my talk. And what I'd love to ask all of you to do today for me is if you'd like um, to receive this gift, which is my seven keys to not sweating the small stuff. <laughs> it's kind of my manifesto. Um, I'd love to ask you to sign up for my newsletter, if you want to, and you'll receive that gift when you sign up. Um, where I'm at now in my own life is that I feel like my journey is completely one of personal growth. It always has been, but now it just, it truly is. It, it, my daughter, Kenna, just left home. She's um, going to Davis. She's 21. She just left home. Uh, Jazz is married and has two kids. I'm a grandmother. And I just had my 50th birthday in July. So I feel like that's a real rite of passage, right? It's a, it's a time, I'm at this real a time in my life where it's kind of an open slate for me. It's very exciting. I thought, um, I went was anticipating a lot of um, emotional um, stuff. You know, I was in my anticipation of Kenna leaving. And, and I realized as soon as I, somebody, I was speaking with you, I realized as soon as I got home and her room was clean and the dishes were exactly as I left them, <laughs> that that really wasn't going to be a problem for me. <laughs> and in fact, it's, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm actually just enjoying owning my own space for the first time ever in my life. So I'm going to launch um, a new blog. It's going to be called Don't Sweat the Change. I'm not quite in the change yet, but I'm getting close. <laughs> so you women will laugh at that. Don't sweat the change. But um, it won't be just about the physical changes that we go through at this age. It's going to be about the um, emotional and spiritual journey that we go through at this age. And how to embrace your life as it is now and reinvent your life as it is now. That's what I'm going through and I just plan to take everyone along with me. So there'll be, um, I'll be sending out an invitation to that. It'll be a monthly call for $9 that will be um, every time at the same month and for that $9 you'll get to have the um, PDF notes of whatever topic I dive into. And it'll be really fun things like how to discover your divine feminine sexual essence. <laughs> you know, things like that. So I invite you to join me um, in that too. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. If anyone does have any questions, you're, I'm welcome. I would love to take a few questions. Is that right, Brandy? Or if anyone has any. Yes. Hi, I'm Cynthia Stott, and Hi. I just want to thank you and your husband for the work that you've done. Oh, thank you. And um, your books were, are, are real, 
um, inspiration to me and my husband. Oh, thank you. And my favorite quote, I, don't, I think it was in Don't Sweat the Small Stuff at Work. It was, um, your inbox is never empty, even when you die. <laughs> and that brought me great comfort when I had to clean out my husband's inbox after he died at 38 mm. while I was on a business trip. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity to have loved and then lost and then reinvented. And the change, it can happen at any time. Yeah. And we never know when our number is up or our loved one's number is up. And we can't wait. And to be honest, if he never died at 38 and left to me with what am I going to do for the rest of my life? I would not be in this room. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? Yes, Machio? Hi, Christine. Hi. Hi. Well, let me step out. I want to publicly thank you for your encouragement and your kind support as I try to write a book with my experience of heartbreaking and not having any children after a difficult time. And um, I'm very, very honored to have you as a friend, oh, thank you. and mm. being, being in the same master group, mastermind group with you, you've been great, great inspiration to thank me, you. and you are so, such an inspiration to many people, especially women of the world. Thank you, Machia. Thank you. Thank you. Your story is also awe inspiring. <laughs> so, thank you. Yes. I have a simple question. Just, um, do you have a speaking schedule where you'll be? I have my brother passed away two years ago, and his wife, my sister in law, a widow, she's just having, she's 67, and so oh. she's having a really hard time moving forward or knowing what what what, what her purpose is now um, because they were married 48 years and you know it's really hard and so I would love to have her hear you you know probably her best way would be to um, be on that call and that, that'll be um, a guest call she can ask questions and I'm sure you know because I'll be gearing that towards reinventing Mm -hmm. and talking about all different topics. So that'd probably be the best place. And then online, if she just looks at my website, um, christinecarlson.com, okay. there's usually a speaking schedule on there. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, thank you.